Here's William Lane Craig to make some silly arguments for the resurrection. Bill, welcome. Let's start with your conclusion. Please summarize the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I think that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection can be summarized under three broad facts. Number one would be the discovery of his empty tomb by a group of his women uh, disciples uh, on the Sunday following his crucifixion. We don't know that this is a fact. What's a fact is that the Gospels claim that the tomb was discovered empty, and exactly who discovered it and how is described differently in each Gospel. John just says Mary Magdalene found it. Matthew says it was Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James. Mark says it was the two Marys and Salome. Luke says that the women, this Gospel doesn't specify which women, followed Joseph to the tomb. So by Luke's account, it wasn't just Jesus as women followers who found the tomb empty. Number two would be the post-mortem appearances of Jesus that were experienced by the earliest disciples. And number three would be the very origin of the disciples' belief that God had raised him from the dead. And I think that the best explanation of those three facts is the one that the disciples themselves gave, namely, God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection, of course, is the core of the Christian faith. So I assume that for your research of the reality or the historicity of the resurrection, everything is at stake. Oh, ye well, not exactly, Robert, because I distinguish between the fact of the resurrection and the evidence for the resurrection. Okay. Of course, whether an event happened or not doesn't hinge upon what evidence there is for its occurrence or non-occurrence, but what does hinge upon the evidence is the credibility of claims about whether the event did or did not happen. Think about it. Uh, we have no evidence for most of the facts or events of history. We have no idea uh, what evidence there would be for these, but they're facts nonetheless. Yeah, but in the same respect, it could be a fact that there is a teapot floating around in the solar system somewhere, but despite its factuality, without evidence, disbelief in such a thing is entirely appropriate. So, Christianity stands or falls on the fact of Jesus' resurrection, but it doesn't stand or fall on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Well, the credibility of Christianity does stand or fall on the evidence for the resurrection. However, as we've recently seen, Craig believes that we should counterbalance the lack of evidence for the resurrection, and indeed evidence to the contrary, with the consideration that the truth of Christianity would be so awesome that we should believe in it in spite of even significant evidence to the contrary. Indeed, it would be rather remarkable if there were evidence for such an extraordinary event. And the extraordinariness of the event exacerbates the need for evidence in order to establish the credibility of claims that it happened. And I think it came as quite a surprise to me in doing my work at the University of Munich in Germany on this that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is so powerful. Craig has a very different standard than I do of what kind of evidence qualifies as so powerful. If someone told me that the evidence for anything is powerful, I would, at the very least, expect multiple independent eyewitness accounts. There's not a single eyewitness account of the resurrection, let alone multiple independent ones. In fact, for something as extraordinary as a resurrection, even multiple eyewitness accounts would not be enough to convince me. For something like that, I'd need to be able to examine the dead body myself, then see it get up and walk around with my own eyes. Nothing short of that could convince me of such a thing. And even then, I would not be convinced that the cause is supernatural. When you started believing in the resurrection as having occurred, but not knowing what the historicity was, what were some of the initial questions that you had or the issues that you faced? I think that for me initially, my question was whether or not these accounts in the New Testament of what happened to Jesus' body after his death, whether these were legendary or not. And I anticipated that one would try to show that these accounts were written fairly early on uh, and therefore were not as susceptible to legendary 
influences. While I'm sure that later accounts are more susceptible to legendary embellishment than earlier ones, there's no reason why they can't be made up by the very first person to tell the story, or be a result of that person's misunderstanding of what really happened. Julius Caesar's account of the Gallic Wars, to which he was a first-hand eyewitness, contains what the archaeological evidence seems to indicate are embellishments, despite the fact that he wrote it as the Gallic Wars were happening. But in the course of my work, uh, things quite changed, and I began to explore the historical traditions that lie behind the New Testament and then drive us even closer back to the original events themselves. It's not clear what Craig means here, but I think by historical traditions, he means the oral traditions. I suspect he's referring to the fact that the Gospels were passed down orally from the time of the events to the time that they were first written down. The earliest Gospels look like they were written about 40 years after the crucifixion, which seems to me like plenty of time for legends to creep in. But Craig seems to be arguing that because those writings are based on the stories being passed down orally for decades, then they technically date to within only a short time period after the events they describe. If that's what he's referring to, then he seems to think that decades of oral repetition reduces the likelihood of legendary embellishment, when I think it actually increases that likelihood. We see significant changes crop up even in the written copies of the Gospels. So imagine how much more prone a purely oral tradition would be to such changes. And so the evidence that emerged was much, much stronger than I ever anticipated it would be. It's interesting how different this is from the conclusion that the New Testament scholar Bert Ehrman came to when examining the texts. Uh, the more I studied it, uh, I, I went off, I went to, I, I did a degree, a Wheaton College in English degree, then I went to Princeton Theological Seminary to do a master's degree studying the New Testament rigorously. By this time I had Greek, um, and I started studying the New Testament rigorously in Greek. And the, these, these manuscripts started bothering me a little bit because uh, I had believed that the Bible was that God's words. It's not just that it was like his communication broadly. It was his very words. <laughs> but then as more I thought about it, I realized, you know, there are places where we don't know what the words are. Um, there are entire passages in the Bible that I was familiar with that probably weren't originally there. They're in some manuscripts, but not in other manuscripts. And so somebody's either added them or somebody's taken them away. And, and how do we know? And so it started that for me, that started a uh, kind of an avalanche of doubt. Like I, I didn't, didn't make me become a non-Christian or anything. It's just like, wow, why is that? You know, if God gave us his words, it, why don't we have them? <laughs> Do you remember your first discovery or, or conviction that you didn't know, but when you realized that it would, it would form um, a, a core of your thinking going forward? I don't remember exactly, but I would think that the discovery that, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is quoting from an old formula that he himself had received that probably goes back to the original church in Jerusalem within five years after the crucifixion. That is astonishingly early. Craig is apparently very easily astonished. If Julius Caesar can put embellishments into his account of the Gallic Wars as he is witnessing them happen, it's not very incredible to suppose that such embellishments could be inserted after five years. Uh, and makes that uh, piece of evidence um, one of the most important in the New Testament. Bill, as you well know, there is a large scholarly literature uh, giving alternative explanations. Scholars who are not believers uh, do not find evidence of a bodily resurrection compelling. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a tautology. Um, a, one critique is that the Gospels themselves on this topic are, as one uh, a, a, a scholar told me, hopelessly contradictory. Uh, for example, whether Jesus appeared in Galilee and or Jerusalem, uh, Mark, supposedly the earliest uh, uh, gospel, has no appearances in, in its original ending, is, is what I've been told. When you read New Testament scholars on the gospel narratives, what you find is that they're not overly concerned about the inconsistencies between the narratives. Well, that seems to depend on which scholar you talk to, because Bart Ehrman seems quite concerned about them. Because these tend to concern secondary details of the narratives, and the historical core remains the same across all the Gospels, uh, as well as in Paul. And so these kinds of uh, inconsistencies would be expected in any sort of uh, historical 
account. While apologists seem like they'd like us to believe that the Bible is not just any sort of historical account, they want us to believe that it consists of infallible accounts. Can you really expect such inconsistencies to be present in an infallible account? To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.